Hello, I'm Sean McQuillan, developer advocate at Google. It's great to be here in Korea. Tian talked a bit about growth. Looking back 10 years ago, Android started with the T-Mobile G1. It was with a simple but bold idea to build a mobile platform that's free and open to everyone. And today, that idea is thriving. Our partners have launched tens of thousands of Android smartphones, used by billions of people all over the world. And through this journey, we've seen Android become more than just a smartphone OS. The growth of Android over the last 10 years has helped fuel the shift in computing from desktop to mobile. And with all of this, our developer community is growing right alongside. In China, India, Korea, and Brazil, the number of developers using our IDE has tripled in two years. And we feel a heavy responsibility to support our vast ecosystem. And listen, if you feel like your feedback drives what I say here, you're right. Like Kotlin last year. Since we made it a fully supported language, we've launched more and more support, taking advantage throughout Android. Already, 35% of pro developers use Kotlin. That number grows every month. 95% of Kotlin users say they're really happy. More and more, Android development is going towards Kotlin, and we're committed for the long term. If you haven't tried it yet, I would. But don't take my advice. I'd like to introduce Hadi from JetBrains to tell you more about the state of Kotlin. Thank you, Sean. Hello, everyone. And um, I hope that you've all heard of Kotlin by now, right? Show some hands, people. Wake up. There you go. Great. So let me tell you a little bit about the state of Kotlin inside and outside of Android. I'm not an Android developer, believe it or not. I'm probably the only non-Android developer here. And I'll share you some information outside. So in 2017, it was a great year for Kotlin. Uh, we released 1.1. Since then, it started to increase drastically. Uh, and then, of course, something happened around May time. I don't know what exactly it was. But when that happened, it started to shoot up. Okay? Obviously, that is uh, when uh, Google announced the official support for Kotlin at I.O. So to give you a summary of that, we've got over 700,000 users right now using Kotlin. That was in 2017. We've got 110 user groups. 1,200 talks alone were given. 14,000 members on Slack. I remember the days it was just three of us on, uh, on a BSD. Uh, you know, bulletin system, IRC, sorry, and uh, over nine books in the works, if not more. And that culminated in 2017 with Kotlin Conf, which was sold out at the first ever conference with 1,200 people, 46 different nations represented there, and over 50 speakers. Now, Kotlin continues to grow. In 2018, we are continuing to grow. We've got 68 million lines of code in terms of open source on GitHub just using Kotlin. And Stack Overflow questions, where everyone goes to figure out how to program, that's continuing to grow. 284,000 usages of plugins per month, and the number of user groups are growing drastically as well every month. In 2018, 17,000 members on Slack. It's becoming impossible to actually follow anything there. Over 30 Kotlin nights being held by community, several community conferences, and of course, we're giving that leading to Kotlin Conf this year as well, with over 1,000 registered attendees already. So Kotlin is growing. It continues to grow, and it's most definitely here to stay. In terms of adoption worldwide, we've got a good number of people using it in the US, in India, in China, and then you can see some of the distribution around the world. But generally, it is getting to all parts of the globe. And focusing a little bit more on APAC, we can see, well, we've got a, you know, uh, you are there, although there are some other countries that are a little bit darker, so you need to um, tone it up a little bit here in South Korea. Now, those people that are adopting Kotlin, this is some of the interesting things, right? 48% of them have switched from other programming languages, 
So they've started using Kotlin maybe as part of a uh, interop with their existing languages, such as the Java programming language, and then eventually have just switched over fully to Kotlin. We've got companies from very small startups to very large companies, meaning that the enterprise is already adopting Kotlin with over 5,000 employees. And what's even more interesting is 2% of the people using Kotlin are using it as their first language. And this is for us really wonderful because we feel that Kotlin can eventually be one of those first languages that you can adopt. In terms of types of applications, now, you may not even know this, but we never developed Kotlin for mobile, right? We developed Kotlin for, our, for, for JetBrains to use for our, our tools, which was desktop server side. Someone went to the forum one day and said, does this work on Android? We said, we don't know. Go try it. They came back. They said it didn't. We fixed it. And then it started to become popular in Android. And we're seeing, obviously, a lot of adoption in terms of Kotlin on the Android side, but we're seeing also adoption on other platforms, whether it's backend, whether it's library, and even IoT and some other things, even in data analysis and, and data science. And in terms of where it's being used, an overwhelmingly number of people are already putting this into production. There are people that are working with it without released products yet. But generally, everyone is using it in hobbies and professional development. And don't take our word only for it. Stack Overflow recently ran their server with over 100,000 developers. And Kotlin is the most, second most loved language ever by all the developers that took that at 71.1%. I won't tell you which one the first is. You'll, you'll have to go look that up in the survey. And in the Bay Dillon 2018 survey, which is quite common in the Java ecosystem. We had Kotlin jumping from 11.4 to 28.8% in just one year. And that's a lot thanks to you folks here that are doing Android development. So what do we have in store moving forward with Kotlin? Well, first of all, we're continuing to working on speed improvements. If you are using Kotlin, you might have noticed that the 1.25 release, which we just released recently, I think it was about a week or two weeks ago, has drastically improved speed. Compile times are faster, whether you're using Gradle or any of the other build systems. We are obviously continuing to add support for tooling with its refactoring, analysis, code inspections. All of these are also coming to our tooling, be it on the IntelliJ side or on Android Studio. Language continues to evolve. If you haven't looked into things like coroutines, which are a way for you to do asynchronous programming, that continues to uh, evolve. We're getting a lot of people adopting that, both inside and outside of the Android space. And of course, our big uh, effort in terms of multi-platform support, right? which is essentially bringing Kotlin to other places through the use of Kotlin Native. So essentially, if you look at the landscape, you've got Kotlin on the server side with Kotlin JVM. You've got Kotlin on Android with Kotlin JVM. You have Kotlin in the browser with Kotlin JavaScript. And now you have Kotlin native, which targets iOS. And of course, Kotlin native can also target uh, Android native. Now, what this means is that with the Kotlin JVM, you can do desktop, server side, Android, Android of Things development. With Kotlin JS, you can do front end and server side if you want to combine that with Node. And with Kotlin Native, that opens up the door to server side development, desktop, embedded across multiple platforms such as Mac OS, Windows, Linux, Raspberry Pi, iOS, and anything essentially that uses LLVM to compile down to a native platform. And that provides us with the ability for you to essentially write Kotlin code and deploy it anywhere you want to. And with that, thank you, and I'll hand it back to Sean. Thanks, Hadi. Coming back to the Android platform, let's cover three main things today. First, distribution, making all apps radically smaller, so you get more installs. Second, development, helping you develop faster with better APIs. And third, engagement, bringing users back more 
and more. Let's go straight into driving installs. And Tian talked about this, but it's really important. Android is growing, which is great. And app sizes are also growing. And this is not great. Apps are targeting more people in more countries, which means APKs have more languages and more features. And the problem is, the larger your app gets, the less installs you get. Now, most people think this is an emerging markets issue, but it's true in all countries. So how could we make it easier to build small apps? Well, our best idea was hard for us. It meant re-architecting our app serving stack, but it was the right thing to do. At iAnnounce, we announced the Android App Bundle. It's a new publishing format, and you can use it to dramatically reduce app size. So apps need a lot of resources to work on every device. The bundle contains it all. But when a user downloads, Google Play's new dynamic delivery only delivers the code and resources a specific device needs. We tested this with many partners, and we're seeing huge savings. LinkedIn saved 23%, Twitter 35%, Jammu 50%. And if you're wondering how many devices this works on, it's 99%. We also designed this so there's almost no work for you. Use Gradle or Android Studio Canary to build app bundles instead of APKs. And then once you build an app bundle, you upload it to Google Play. And Google Play looks at your app bundle, and generates a lightweight binary with only the code and resources needed for a specific device. When a user downloads your app, they get only the content they need to run it on their phone. And you can use all of this now. App bundles and dynamic delivery launched for production last month. We're also working to increase installs in other ways. Please welcome Benjamin. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Ben Frankel. I'm a product manager working on the Google Play Instant team. And I focus in games and have been focused on games since I joined Google four years ago. And I know the first audience participation question didn't seem to go over that well, but let me see if I can try it again. How many people in the audience here are game developers? And you know, if you can raise, I see one hand. Get some more hands. Come on, let's see if you're a game developer. I want to see the hands. I can see you. And I can, OK, great. So there's a decent representation of game developers here. So to give you some context for what I'm about to talk about, at IO, IO 2017, we announced Android Instant Apps. It was kind of a rethink of application delivery that combined the ease of access of web with the performance and fidelity of native Android experiences. And since then, we've been pretty busy. We've enabled Instant Apps to work on over a billion devices. And it's over 1.2 billion now and always growing. And in addition to that, we've made major improvements to the way that people build instant experiences with an overhaul of the tooling in Android Studio to make it even faster and easier to build instant apps. And at I.O., just this past May, we announced that Google Play Instant, now the new brand of Android instant app, Google Play Instant, was available to all game developers. And I'll talk about some of the changes we made to make that possible. But let's take a look at Google Play Instant in action with one of the recent additions to our portfolio of Instant Apps. So the Candy Crush team at King 
launched the instant version of Candy Crush just this past May, and it's available in the store right now. You can go check it out, and you'll see a new Try Now button that's been introduced so people can play the, experience the game before downloading it. But just think about it for a second. That's Candy Crush, one of the most successful mobile games of all time coming to Google Play Instant. And the reason why partners like King are excited about Google Play Instant is the vision that bringing Instant to games will transform game discovery. And there's two key reasons I wanted to point out today about why this is so potentially transformative to how people discover games. So the first one is, is that playing a game is the right way to evaluate and compare games. It's the right medium for games. When you think about how you evaluate music, you listen to it. When you're thinking about a movie you're about to watch, you watch a preview, right? You watch something that is similar in form factor to the thing you want to evaluate. And instant games, Google Play, powered by Google Play Instant, is the right media for evaluating and exploring and discovery games. And the second piece is that Instant by itself, that last part of Google Play Instant, is extremely important to the process of people discovering. And we know that this is possible. We know this is something that actually happens because we've seen this movie before. Whenever media becomes instant, consumption goes up. Speed is an enormous competitive advantage. We've seen this happen when movies and music went to streaming. People changed how they explored music. And before that, Google proved the transformative impact of speed with instant search. And what we want to do is we want to take that value of instant that's been created in these other media and bring it to games. And that's because we believe that instant will do the same thing for you. Imagine players of your games trying more titles, exploring more genres, and ultimately finding more games they love to play. That would have a transformative impact on your business. Instead of people downloading one or two games in a session, people could try dozens of games at a time. And so we had this hypothesis that Instant would have this impact. And over the course of our early access program, some of the biggest partners in gaming, we proved this theory out. And as you can see here, the most visible entry point to an instant experience is this Try Now button. So if you look up Clash Royale or Mighty Battles or Candy Crush, you'll see this Try Now button here. And with just the Try Now button, just the Try Now button, our early access partners saw up to 20% increase in user acquisitions. That's a big deal for our partners. And again, that was just try now alone. And that just scratches the surface of the Google Play Instant opportunity. Users can discover your instant experience through ads, through the Play Games app, through social invites, and through banners and collections on the store. And we've added new discovery surfaces recently. In particular, the Try Now feature has been added to pre-registration. So soon players that pre-register for your games will get a sneak preview, will get a sneak preview of the game as they pre-register. And when you promote pre-registration on social media, on email, through your website, Users will be able to play instantly from any Android device. It's an awesome way to introduce your game to the world. And we've been fortunate to have some of the largest game developers in the world work with us. And when you look at what they've done, and you explore the instant experiences they've already created, and you hear about what they're excited about, not just what they've, not just about what they've done, but what they hope to do with the platform, you can start to see how important a role Google Play Instant can play throughout the life cycle of a game. From games that have yet to launch all the way to games that have been around for a while, the right instant experience 
can have a transformative impact on your business. But there are three particular experiences that I wanted to walk you through today out of the many, many exciting examples from our early access partners. Starting with a particular type of experience that is a great fit for upcoming launches. And uh, the, this example is called the minigame. You may have experienced minigames before. I believe it was popularized in Korea with Lineage M's minigame. In that case, it was a, uh, a mobile experience. But the minigame, just like that, is often a complementary experience to the full game. And it's a great fit for pre-registration. In Dancehall's minigame, you can choreograph a routine by manipulating the individual limbs of this cute cartoon character. Get to do any dance you want. And once you are done, once you've created your dream dance routine, you can then share an animated GIF with your friends. It offers endless combinations of moves and entertainment that will occupy your players all the way through to the eventual launch. And the second example, also a good fit for upcoming launches, is what we're call calling the core gameplay preview. The goal of this archetype is to provide users a glimpse of the experience in the game after the introductory levels. And just to, to highlight sort of the differences in the approach here, uh, in the installed app, in the installed app, when you load up this game called Zombie Gunship Revenant, which is an AR game as well, which you'll be hearing more about later, when you, when you load it up for the first time, you get a tutorial level. So you have one machine gun, you know, which is cool, but the zombies come at a glacial place. They arrive very slowly, and it's about getting you used to the mechanics of the game and so forth. But a different take on it that they used for the instant app was designed to get the player's adrenaline pumping. And so what they did, in contrast, is they gave you not one but two machine guns, which is definitely better than one machine gun. Then you got a sniper rifle, an overpowered sniper rifle, and hellfire missiles. And the zombies came at an impossible pace to protect against. And so it r accomplished its goal. It's a very, very exciting experience. You can go check it out on the store today. And it's a great fit for both the try now option as well as ads and any other place where you want to acquire and get users excited about your game. And for games that have been around for a while, and as your goal goes from new users to keeping users on your platform, driving your attention, and bringing back churn users, this game highlights pattern might be the right fit for you. And Candy Crush is a great example of this. What they've done is they've taken five awesome levels from level 16 all the way to level 590 from their game. And each was selected to highlight a unique combination of game mechanics. The example of level 590 all the way on your right, I think, uh, is it, it's particularly interesting to me because it's so different from what I came to expect in my experience of Candy Crush. So first of all, the, the board of candies moves around perpetually, and they introduce this concept of a portal right in the middle of it that absorbs candies. I had never seen anything like this in Candy Crush before, and the goal was to provide users a glimpse of what they were missing out on since the last time they played. So if most of your users leave at, let's say, level 50, like I did, you would never have seen some of these really exciting game mechanics. And so it's a great way, if you can target those users that have churned already, to bring people back to your game by showing them something that they would have missed out on. So hopefully, that gives you a sense of the role that Google Play Instant can play throughout the life cycle of a game. And now that you have that locked in, let's turn our attention to how you build an instant experience. And just like we want to make it as easy as possible, remove as much friction as possible for users getting into your games, we also want to make it as easy as possible for you to build instant experiences. And we've made substantial investments in this area. It all starts off by taking the Android Instant App framework that was originally built for games and adapting it to better suit the unique needs of game developers. And there were three important changes that we made. So the first one was 
we increased the size limit for games to 10 megabytes. It had formerly been 4 megabytes for apps, and we made it 10 megabytes. The second thing is we enabled the progressive download of executable code and assets so people can start playing your game before everything is on the device. And lastly, and very importantly, we added Game Engine, NDK, and OpenGL support to the framework. And that did two things, two very important things. So the first is it allows you to use the same code base as your full game to build the instant experience. And the second thing is it allows you to build with the tools that you're already familiar with. Very important component of our strategy. And for the Unity developers out there, you'll be excited to hear that we've made major investments to support Unity and Google Play Instant. And the first thing we did was we built a plugin, which is available,、uh, in fact, now, so the slide should be updated. It's available now on GitHub, so you can go and download it if you're a Unity developer and start building your instant experiences. And if you're concerned about the 10 megabyte size limit, because if you're a Unity developer, that might sound intimidating, don't worry about it. We have you covered. And so if you want to build instant experiences today, we recommend you sign up for our Unity beta program, which you can see at the link here. And that allows us to give you a, the latest news on what's going on with the Unity plugin. But it also allows us to give you some wiggle room on that 10 megabytes, because we're going to be releasing beta features that make it much easier in collaboration with Unity to get down to the smallest size possible. So if 10 megabytes was a concern, let me. Alleviate that concern, sign up for the beta, and we'll take care of you. Go start building your instant experiences today with Unity. And for those of you who are Cocos developers in the audience here, we've got good news for you too. Cocos has added instant support in their IDE Cocos Creator, but they've gone beyond just merely supporting Google Play Instant as a build target. They've also invested in simplifying the process of building. An instant app. And what they've done is they've added two steps to their standard build process. They added the record step and the refactor step. On the record step, what you do is you actually just play your game in the Coco simulator, and Coco's creator records what assets are used when. And then in the refactor step, All that information is compiled together, and then with a visual, nonlinear editing style interface, you can Define the boundaries of your instant experience. And you can further optimize things with a list by category of all your assets.、So、you can substitute high res textures for low res textures and so forth. And an alpha build is, in fact, available today for the adventurous to try. So that brings me to the end of this presentation on Google Play Instant. I hope you found it interesting. And、uh, here is a set of links that you might find useful. You can get access to the Getting Started Guide at the first link here. We recommend strongly that if you want to build a Unity app, that you sign up for our Unity Beta, which is the middle link. And if you are adventurous and you want to check out the latest version of Coco's Creator with Google Play Instant support, with the fancy new nonlinear video editing style tools, then check out the right link there. With that, thank you. And I'll bring up Sean. You go, sir. Oh, oh, oh you already have one. Now let's dive into our second theme making app development easier. Android's APIs could be easier. Can we get the slides? Thank you. One person said on Android, there are six ways to do everything. And last year, we launched architecture components as a test bed for new ideas, starting in top areas that you flagged, like life cycles and data. Today, so many top apps are using these in production. More than half of you already use these libraries or plan to in the next year. At I.O., we announced Android Jetpack. The next generation of Android APIs to accelerate app development. Android Jetpack is a set of libraries and tools. We set the basic DNA by including the support library and architecture components. 
Jetpack brings everything together coherently and adds even more new libraries. Work Manager, Navigation, Paging, Slices, and Kotlin extensions across the libraries. All libraries are backwards compatible and work on 95% of devices. Now, it's been a pain to schedule background tasks. With Work Manager, you get a single, easy-to-use API, which works nearly everywhere. And Android Jetpack is all about concise APIs. Those who've tried it say they're writing about a third less code. Jetpack and Kotlin are intentionally designed to work together. So you write only the code you need for a pleasant reading and writing experience. Jetpack saves time by embodying what we have found works best for Android development, like Rx Java, material design. Jetpack APIs are integrated with IDE tools, too. For instance, in Android Studio, you get a navigation editor which works with the library. You can visualize your app flow almost like you're sketching on a whiteboard. You can add new screens, position them in your flow, and under the covers, we help you manage the back stack, even conditional flows, so you can get transitions just right. Overall, IDE tools are great helpers to make development fast. That's why everything you've seen so far, building app bundles, using Jetpack, and more, comes with Android Studio support. The team also worked on making everyday tasks faster. You told us to work on the emulator boot time. Let me show you how quickly the new emulator can start. Ready, set, go. As you can see, it's nearly immediate. And no, I'm not cheating. Th this is a video, but the timing is not edited. And the reason that it's so fast is that we support snapshots. We store the full state of the running emulator into a file that we load back in. So no more excuses to get coffee, because the emulator is booting. There are more speed enhancements. We added an energy profiler, integrated and improved system trace. There's a C++ profiler now, too. We promoted the D8 compiler to stable after testing it on our own Android platform, which means you get smaller, faster binaries by default. We added an ADB connection assistant to fix, hey, why can't I connect to that device? So that's Android development, faster and easier. We hope you try the Android Studio and Jetpack previews, including all of the new Alpha Stage libraries. And Jetpack is just beginning. We're testing many more ideas to add in the seasons ahead. OK, once your app is built, installed, we want to get users coming back. Slices are a cool way to drive re-engagement. They're easy to build. You'll find templates that are rich and flexible. So you can compose. You can start with something simple, like a set of rows, or grids, then you can add content like text and images. But not just static content. You can house real-time data and rich controls. Once you assemble these pieces into the perfect setup, you can add the code to make slices highly interactive, like pause the song or go to the next one. And now I have this cool mini snippet of my app. And because it's Jetpack, it works on 95% of devices, not just the new ones, showing the power of building new features in a Jetpack world. This is ready for everyone here to try today. And here's a link to the Slices beta info and tools. Your Slices will start showing in search this summer, timed with the P launch and Assistant later this year. With Android P, we're creating a new way to drive engagement to your app. It uses AI to predict the next action users want to take. Let's take a look at how this works. 
At the top of the launcher, you can see two actions. One is to call Fiona, and the other is to start a workout on Strava for my evening run. So what's happening here is the actions are being predicted based on my usage patterns. The phone is adapting to me and trying to help me get to my next task more quickly. As another example, if I connect my headphones, Android will surface an action to resume the album I was listening to. To support actions in your app, you just need to add an actions.xml file. Actions will surface not just in the launcher, but in multiple places, including smart text selection, the Play Store, the Google Search app, and the Assistant. Take Google Search. We're experimenting with different ways to surface actions for apps that are already installed. For example, the Fandango app has implemented app actions. So when I search for the Avengers movie, in addition to regular suggestions, I now get an action to buy tickets. As you can see, this is a great way to surface your key app flows while your user is outside of your app. It's pretty cool. This is a great time to be an Android developer. Android is growing, and your app can grow with it using features like Android app bundles, slices, and actions. And Jetpack helps you write less code to build great apps. Thank you for joining us today. I'd like to introduce Hadi and Benjamin back up. So welcome to the conference, and I hope everyone has a great day. Cheers.